Monica Diane Sanders was born April 15, 1968 to Doris and James Sanders. She was described as a sweet, kind-hearted person that loved children. She graduated from Falk High School and became a fifth-year ballet student. On August 21, 1988, 20-year-old Monica went to a dance club formerly called The Pines on Highway 67 in Texarkana, Arkansas, which is now called Electric Cowboy. Her friends were ready to leave before she was, so a man named Johnny offered to give her a ride home so she could stay. She was later seen leaving with 26-year-old Johnny Westbrook, a man that lived only a couple of blocks from her family. Monica had planned a birthday party for her seven-year-old sister, Christy, the very next day, but she never showed up. Concerned, her mother walked over to the neighbor's house where Monica was supposed to have stayed the night. However, Monica was nowhere to be found. They quickly went to police to report her missing, but were frustratedly told that they had to wait 48 hours before making the report. Sadly, nine days later, her body was found in Mercer Bayou in a wooded area in Texarkana. Investigators say she had been sexually assaulted, beaten, and shot three times in the chest, and her teeth had been knocked out. Strangely, her killer neatly folded her clothing and placed them along with her boots next to her body. The man she left the club with that night, Johnny Westbrook, was later arrested and charged with her murder. There were three suspected accomplices as well, David Brown, Kendall Payne, and Rick Flippo. One was arrested, but the charges were dropped. The other men were never charged, but all four reportedly failed lie detector tests. While interviewing Johnny, police noticed he had three scratches on his torso the day after she went missing. They took pictures and questioned him about the scratches, but he gave conflicting stories on how he received them. However, this info was never turned into the jury during his trial for first-degree murder and Johnny would be acquitted. Her family believes someone out there knows what happened and they pray that they come forward to give them closure. Because Monica was known for her love of children, the Falk City Park was renamed Monica Sanders Memorial Park. Sadly, it was later vandalized and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Ronald Henry Tamman Jr. was born July 23, 1933, and went by the nickname Ron. He was brought up by a wealthy and patriotic family in Maple Heights, Ohio, a suburb of Cleveland. He was a varsity wrestler, a member of the ROTC, played string bass in a jazz band called the Campus Owls, and was described as handsome, smart, and studious. He had plans to become a stockbroker once he earned his business degree. At the age of 19, he lived in a dorm at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, and was also the resident hall advisor with a good GPA. The dorm was called Fisher Hall and was a former Victorian mental asylum that had been converted to a dormitory. On April 19, 1953, Ron spent the early evening studying and hanging out with friends. Around 7 p.m., he was seen down the hall in a friend's room helping him with his homework. About 9 p.m., Ron requested new bed sheets from the hall manager because someone had put a dead fish in his bed. Reports say about 30 minutes later, he apparently heard something outside his room that disturbed him, and he went out into the hallway to investigate, but strangely, he never returned. It is unclear who witnessed him leaving his room and provided this information. Ron's roommate, Chuck Finlay, returned to campus from visiting family and came into their room after 10 p.m. and found Ron gone. Chuck had first assumed that Ron was spending the night at his Delta Tau Delta fraternity house and did not report his disappearance until the next day. His clothes, car keys, wallet, ID, bank book, high school class ring, and other personal items were left behind in his dorm room. He also left the lights on, the radio playing, and a psychology textbook lying open on his desk. Curiously, he had actually dropped his psychology course three weeks earlier. His gold Chevrolet sedan was not taken from its place in the school parking lot. His bass fiddle was still in the backseat of the car, and he left behind $200 in his bank account. About a week after he disappeared, about 400 students canvassed the area looking for him. 
Weeks later, his mother reported him missing to the FBI. Authorities have not found any indications of foul play in Ron's disappearance. They theorize that he could have developed amnesia and wandered away, but if that was the case, he should have been found relatively quickly. A couple months after he went missing, a woman living in Seven Mile, Ohio, 12 miles east of the Miami University campus, claims that a young man came to her door around midnight the evening Ron disappeared and asked what town he was in. Then he asked directions to the bus stop, which she gave him, and he left. However, the bus line had suspended its midnight run, so he could not have gotten on a bus. The witness says the man she spoke to was disheveled and dirty and appeared upset and confused. He was not wearing a coat or hat, although it was a cold night and there was snow on the ground. She believed he was walking and not in a car. The man matched the physical description of Ron and was wearing similar clothes, but it has not been confirmed that they were the same person. Strangely, five months to the day before Ron vanished, he went to the Butler County Coroner's Office in Hamilton, Ohio, and asked Dr. Garrett Boone for a test to have his blood typed. The coroner claims that this was the only such request he ever got in his 35 years of practice. When the doctor asked why he wanted the blood test, he stated in case he wanted to give blood someday. Dr. Boone sent him to Mercy Hospital, where a blood sample was taken, and Ron got his results sent to him at Fisher Hall, which were O positive. It's unknown why Ron didn't just get the test done on campus at the University Hospital where it was available. Ron was scheduled for a physical exam by the Selective Service for induction into the Army, but inductees did not need to know their blood type in advance of the physical. Researchers today are puzzled by the lack of paperwork surrounding his case. With so many people involved in the investigation, there should be piles and piles of information. Yet, in 2008, when the case was reopened, the police found a single piece of paper describing a traffic violation. Jennifer Winger, a Miami University alumnus, began researching Ron's case in 2010 and spent nine years trying to solve it. She doesn't think Ron died around the time of his disappearance and thinks he lived for an extended period, perhaps as long as 42 years, which would place his death sometime in 1995. She bases this conclusion on the fact that the FBI discarded Ron's fingerprint records in 2002. Regulations allow them to destroy fingerprint records seven years after a person's death. Her belief is that Ron's psychology professor was involved with the CIA and that Ron may have been recruited into the agency. When Fisher Hall was demolished in 1978, authorities combed through the rubble looking for any evidence of Ron but found nothing and as of today, this case remains unsolved. In October 2009, the Jamison family lived in the town of Eufaula, Oklahoma, and consisted of Bobby, his wife Sherry Lynn, and their six-year-old daughter Madison and dog Macy. On October 8th, they loaded their pickup truck and headed into Oklahoma's Sands Boys Mountains. The family traveled 30 miles to a 40-acre plot of land that they were thinking of buying in an area called Red Oak. The plan was to live off-grid in a storage shed that they owned until they could build on the land. They visited an associate of the landowner, and when the meeting was done, the family went for a short walk for about 15 minutes. GPS from the phone showed that they walked away from the truck, took a picture of Madison in the remote area, and then returned to the truck not long after. After they returned to their vehicle, they drove a little further and then, with the truck left locked in the middle of a dirt track, they vanished. Nine days later, on October 17th, hunters came across the Jamison's abandoned truck northwest of Red Oak and called police to report the vehicle because it had a dog locked inside. They quickly rescued the thirsty and malnourished dog. The truck was about an hour's drive from the Jamison's home in Uvala. The family was nowhere to be seen despite a large search of the area around the truck. The sheriff at first thought that the truck had been stolen, but soon realized something far more serious had taken place. He launched one of the largest search operations in Oklahoma history. 
It consisted of a thousand volunteers, 13 dog teams, helicopters, horses, mules, ATVs, and an unmanned drone, and they found nothing. During the searches, the cadaver dog teams repeatedly found scent near a nearby water tower, which was then drained and searched, but nothing was found. Police searched the truck and found Bobby and Sherry Lynn's cell phones, $32,000 in cash in a bank bag under the seat, maps, a GPS, Sherry Lynn's purse, wallets, and empty pill bottles. The vehicle was in working order, had fuel, and hadn't been in an accident. The only thing missing was a brown briefcase and the 22 caliber gun that Sherry Lynn was known to keep in the truck. The $32,000 in cash was puzzling because the couple were both on disability at the time. Some wonder if it was to buy the land or something more sinister like drug dealing. In the truck, investigators found an 11-page hate letter from Sherry Lynn to Bobby where she claimed he didn't care about his daughter. She listed all the things she hated about him, including that he was a loner and a hermit and that she wanted a divorce. During their initial investigations, police found no signs of a struggle in the vehicle nor on the soft ground around the truck. There was no blood, but their belongings were strewn about the truck. Also, it was parked in such a way that it appeared that they were leaving and were stopped by somebody. About a week after the truck was found and identified, investigators searched the family home. They came upon an extensive outside surveillance system, which was less common in 2009 than it is today. Some speculate this was due to a drug ring, but their family said it was due to Bobby's father often threatening him and they were afraid and that the couple were not involved in illegal drugs. However, they did say the couple had lost an unhealthy amount of weight. Video surveillance from the day the family left the home was reviewed. The video shows Bobby and Sherry Lynn walking back and forth around 30 times from their house to their truck loading items. Sometimes they weren't even carrying anything at all and they even changed clothes multiple times. They were seen putting things in the truck and then returning it to the house and then back to the truck. It gets even stranger because at times they would stop and stand with a blank look on their faces. A psychologist reviewed the footage and stated that the couple appeared to be on drugs. Six years earlier in 2003, Bobby had a car accident that left him with chronic back pain and on painkillers. Sherry Lynn suffered from bipolar disorder but was non-compliant with her meds, so she often experienced bouts of severe depression and anger issues. Her mother said that her mental state declined two years prior when her sister passed away. Also, the marriage was said to be in turmoil and the family kept to themselves. Bobby and Sherry Lynn had spoken to a local pastor about their belief that their home was invaded by dark spirits and that an exorcism might be needed. This was because Madison had started talking to an imaginary friend named Emily and Sherry Lynn believed Emily was actually a malevolent entity. At one point, Bobby asked the pastor if he knew where he could purchase special bullets to shoot a handful of spirits whom he said were living on the roof of the family's home. Bobby was also planning on trying to exorcise the spirits in the home with the help of a copy of the Satanic Bible that he had purchased and Sherry Lynn owned a witch's Bible. All three members of the family said they often saw spirits in the home and Sherry Lynn was a self-proclaimed witch. A friend of Sherry Lynn's told the police that she sometimes conducted seances with Sherry Lynn, though Sherry Lynn took them much more seriously than she did. Both friends and family agreed with the Jamesons that their home was haunted, and a few have shared that they too experienced odd things inside the house. Sherry Lynn's best friend Nikki said when she visited the home, she felt a horrible presence and would leave feeling down and depressed. Sherry Lynn had also written graffiti on their storage container that they planned to live in about her black cats being poisoned, as she believed that someone from the neighborhood had killed her cats. One read, three cats killed to date by people in this area. Another read, witches don't like their black cat killed. Sherry Lynn believed that her neighbors had been poisoning their cats, so she wrote on the container to scare them off. A series of events occurred throughout 2009 that took a toll on the family. 
Madison suffered an injury at school from a swing, which resulted in Bobby and Sherry Lynn pulling Madison out of school and filing a lawsuit against the school. In July 2009, Sherry Lynn's ex-husband from her first marriage took custody of their son, Colton, and in September, Sherry Lynn was hospitalized following a failed suicide attempt. During the custody hearing, 12-year-old Colton said he would prefer to live with his dad, and he gave a statement about his mother, claiming that she had seemed very depressed and that she often acted strangely. Finally, in August, they dealt with a maintenance man by the name of Kenneth Bellows, who was also a family friend who lived with the family in exchange for helping around the house due to Bobby's deteriorating physical condition. Sherry Lynn's relationship with Kenneth took a turn for the worst when he found out about her Native American heritage because he was a white supremacist. She allegedly shot into the ground next to his feet and ordered him to leave. However, he was in jail at the time the family disappeared. Four years later, on November 16, 2013, less than three miles from where the truck was located, deer hunters discovered the skeletal remains of two adults and one child. They were in the Smokestack Hollow area of Panola Mountain. The bodies were found lined up side by side with their faces down. Forensic testing confirmed eight months later that the remains were Bobby, Sherilyn, and Madison Jameson. Investigators found a flower lying next to Madison's body in the remote area. When questioned why the initial searches did not locate their bodies, police stated that falling leaves potentially obscured the bodies. Some speculate whether the bodies were actually missed during one of the largest searches in Oklahoma history or were they placed there later. Due to only being skeletal remains, a cause of death could not be determined. However, the coroner did find a small hole in Bobby's skull that might have been from a bullet, but neither Sherry Lynn nor Madison had any gunshot evidence. The coroner said that it could also have been caused by animal activity, but some people disagree with this. The gun that was possibly used to kill Bobby was never found. Sherry Lynn's mother, Connie, claims her daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughter were on an Oklahoma cult hit list. Connie didn't provide the name of the alleged cult, nor have police found any links to one, but it is allegedly a white supremacist cult, and it was thought that the man that Sherry Lynn had a falling out with over her heritage put a hit out on the family. The area of Oklahoma where the Jamisons lived, as well as the area they were hoping to move to in the Sands Boys Mountains, is well known for meth use. Bobby had recently reported someone in the local area for running a meth lab prior to their murders. One theory is that the Jamisons came upon illegal drug activity, saw more than they were supposed to, and were killed to keep them quiet. But why didn't the dealers search the truck and take the valuables? After a search of the house, police found no drug paraphernalia and no evidence they were taking meth or any other illegal substances. Another theory by many is that the family was killed by Bobby's father, Bob Dean Jameson. The family had filed a protective order against him, claiming that he had threatened to kill them over some business dealings. In the protective order filed in April 2009, Bobby alleged that his father had intentionally hit him with his car on November 1, 2008, and that he was a very dangerous man who thinks he is above the law, and that he was involved in prostitutes, gangs, meth, and even the Mexican mafia. Bobby and his father had a long-running feud regarding the proceeds from the sale of a gas station. Bobby accused his father of reneging on an agreement to give him half the proceeds from the sale. Bobby's father died two months after the family went missing, and police ruled him out as a suspect. Bobby's uncle said that Bob Dean was a disturbed individual, but not capable of murder. When police examined Bobby's phone from the truck, they found a final picture of Madison taken up on the mountain. The family's pastor, Gary Brandon, told police during the initial investigation that the family had been involved in spiritual warfare from what Sherry Lynn said was the spirits of a long-dead family that was living with them. The remains of an old abandoned vehicle were found near where the family truck was found. It was used for shooting practice by locals, and written on it were satanic messages. Police ruled out murder-suicide because no gun was located at the scene, although Sherry Lynn could have shot Bobby, hid the gun, and then poisoned herself and her daughter. The question still remains, what happened to the brown briefcase the couple was seen loading into their truck that day? 
Some think they got lost and succumbed to the elements, but why were their bodies not found during the surge? With Bobby's bad back, it's doubtful they would have planned to go on a long hike or adventure. The medical examiner ruled their cause of death as inconclusive, and the case has become one of America's most bizarre mysteries. After many years, the question still remains, were they murdered, lost in the woods, or was it a murder-suicide? Let me know in the comments what you think happened. Darlene Tilly was born November 1, 1966 to Donnie and Patricia. She was described as a quiet, loving, passionate person. On September 14, 1980, 13-year-old Darlene and her best friend, Tammy Carden, spent the afternoon playing softball and hanging out at the Glen School ball field. Darlene was planning to walk home and Tammy offered to walk with her, but Darlene declined and said she would walk alone. She was last seen by multiple witnesses walking on a service road near the woods north of Durham near I-85 about 5.30. Two months later, on November 15th, hunters found her body in an area known as the Flats, about 60 to 70 feet off the Oxford Highway near Technica Parkway. It was located in an open field eight miles from her home near railroad tracks. The coroner reported that she died of blunt force trauma and multiple stab wounds. In an unfortunate incident, the results of her autopsy were later destroyed when the pipes burst in the courthouse where the records were being held. Darlene's unsolved murder is currently the oldest unsolved murder in North Carolina history, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. 